Okay. Is it, yeah. Does it say recording? All right. Yes. It's working. It just doesn't want to. There we go. <laughs> okay. Good morning. Great to see all of you. So now that we're through with our quiz, um, so we're going to start chapter three. And this week, you're talking about Jonathan Edwards and Anne Bradstreet. And Jonathan Edwards was responsible for the Great Awakening. And they both um, did amazing things. And most of you have probably heard sermons in church um, like what you're going to hear from him. But back then, nobody had ever heard anything like this. And it stirred this great revival across the country. And so, uh, we're still talking about Puritism. Chapter 3. And he was a Calvinist. And if you're not familiar with that term, it basically um, uh, is a term that means that they believe that God selects who he's going to encourage to accept Christ. He's going, he, he chooses you to, to accept Christ. Um, obviously the Holy Spirit makes the transformation in you with Christ, but um, Calvinists believe it's God chooses you. So in chapter three, we're going to, uh, you're going to be reading like a diary entry from his daughter, um, Jonathan Edwards' daughter, and you're going to read a short essay by Cotton Mather, and um, you're going to read a treaty concerning religious affections by Jonathan Edwards, and diary entries from Esther Edwards, and poems by Anne Bradstreet. And so his daughter, Esther, is kept a diary when she was younger and recorded a lot of what was going on at the time. Um, a valuable resource that teaches us a lot about what was going on with the Puritans at the time. So we're going to watch our video, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And it's only about seven minutes, so hopefully... Let's fix our technical glitch here for a minute. of God. 
God is like great waters that are damned for the present. They increase more and more and rise higher and higher till an outlet is given. And the longer the stream is stopped, the more rapid and mighty is its course when once it is let loose. It is true that judgment against your evil works has not been executed hitherto. The floods of God's vengeance have been withheld. But your guilt in the meantime is constantly increasing, and you are every day treasuring up more wrath. The waters are constantly rising and waxing more and more mighty. And there is nothing but the mere pleasure of God that holds the waters back, that are unwilling to be stopped, and press hard to go forward. If God should only withdraw his hand from the floodgate, it would immediately fly open, and the fiery floods of the fierceness and wrath of God would rush forth with inconceivable fury, and would come upon you with omnipotent power, and if your strength were ten thousand times greater than it is, yea, ten thousand times greater than the strength of the stoutest, sturdiest devil in hell, it would be nothing to withstand or endure it. The bow of God's wrath is bent, and the arrow made ready on the string, and justice bends the arrow at your heart, and strains the bow, and it is nothing but the mere pleasure of God, and that of an angry God, without any promise or obligation at all, that keeps the arrow one moment from being made drunk with your blood. Thus, all you that never passed under a great change of heart, by the mighty power of the Spirit of God upon your souls, all you that were never born again, and made new creatures, and raised from being dead in sin, to a state of new, and before altogether unexperienced light and life, or in the hands of an angry God. However, you may have reformed your life in many things, and may have had religious affections, and may keep up a form of religion in your families and closets, and in the house of God it is nothing but his mere pleasure that keeps you from being this moment swallowed up in everlasting destruction. However unconvinced you may now be of the truth of what you hear, by and by you will be fully convinced of it. Those that are gone from being in the like circumstances with you see that it was so with them. For destruction came suddenly upon most of them when they expected nothing of it, and while they were saying, peace and safety, now they see that those things on which they depended for peace and safety were nothing but thin air and empty shadows. The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. He is of purer eyes than to bear to have you in his sight. You are ten thousand times more abominable in his eyes than the most hateful, venomous serpent is in ours. You have offended him infinitely more than ever a stubborn rebel did his prince, and yet it is nothing but his hand that holds you from falling into the fire every moment. It is to be ascribed to nothing else that you did not go into hell last night, that you were suffered to awake again in this world after you closed your eyes to sleep. And there is no other reason to be given why you have not dropped into hell since you arose in the morning, but that God's hand has held you up. There is no other reason to be given why you have not gone to hell since you have sat here in the house of God, provoking his pure eyes by your sinful, wicked manner of attending his solemn worship. Yea, there is nothing else that is to be given as a reason why you do not this very moment drop down into hell. O oh, sinner, consider the fearful danger you are in. It is a great furnace of wrath, a wide and bottomless pit, full of the fire of wrath, that you are held over in the hand of that God, whose wrath is provoked and incensed as much against you as against many of the damned in hell. You hang by a slender thread with the flames of divine wrath flashing about it and ready every moment to singe it and burn it asunder, and you have no interest in any mediator, and nothing to lay hold of to save yourself, nothing to keep off the flames of wrath, nothing of your own, nothing that you have ever done 
nothing that you can do to induce God to spare you one moment. Okay. That was good. <laughs> Intense. Good. Intense. Yes. Okay. So, does it, did you hear anything in there? Do you see how 1741, how his passion and him painting such a picture would have stirred so many people? So, I can see why there was controversy over it, though. Yes. <laughs> I think there is really something great way to be told something like that. Yeah. True, true. That it's not good enough to just be a good person. You, you're you still going to suffer the wrath of God even if you've been a good person, a good neighbor, a good citizen. But you, you're you still subject to that. So. I think people would still argue it today, though. Like, still saying that that's a little too intense. Because I feel like the church has changed so much in the past, like, you know, 300 years since crazy to think that this was something of its time and then how we've grown and changed since then it's been not necessarily for worse but not necessarily for better it's just way better. well let me ask you a question did he say anything that wasn't true so sometimes it's um this reminds me of the sermons you might it, some people label them as like fire and brimstone kind of sermons do you yeah. think so, um, and sometimes it's very painful to hear the truth, to recognize the fact that, you know, you are a sinner, and you are subject to the wrath of God. And so, um, you're right, there would still be controversy today in some churches or some communities for a that, sermon like that. That's something that just needs to be preached one Sunday, like, nationwide, everybody. <laughs> Broadcasted. Yeah. Broadcast like, this. At the, um, <laughs> at the next peace, peaceful protest they have, you know, broadcast it. Broadcast that. Oh, yeah. So, we certainly need a great awakening. We need a revival to break out across the land again. We need a couple of revivals. Any other observations about this sermon? You're going to study it this week and a little bit more in depth and answer some questions. And that was only part of it. That was that was a very brief like seven bit. intense minutes of it. <laughs> but that wasn't even like I mean, imagine how long the sermon is. So, do we know how long it is? Like, do we know if this was preached? Um, do we know I don't know. That was the I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm presuming that it's significantly longer. So. And back then, they probably did longer sermons. And the first female poet to be published both in England and in England. I was going to say, um, I don't know about your churches, but some churches I've been to, the sermon's like 15 minutes, and sometimes it's, you know, two hours. So it just depends on... Um, the pastor has mercy. He doesn't do two hours. I just go a friend to her church, and I just read it every minute of that. So it was like a two and a half hour thing, and I'm like, whoa. That was kind of an awakening for me. So I was like, I've never heard anyone. It was a good sermon. It wasn't bad. It was just, I was like, wow, this is. Sometimes it's a cultural thing, too. Sometimes um, different cultures, the preaching just goes for an extended period of time. So. Other questions? Or comments? Okay. Um, we're also going to study about Anne Bradstreet. And she wrote some um, great poems, and uh, we're going to learn about her biography. She wrote a poem about her house catching on fire, and uh, you're going to study that week as that this week as well. So let's watch this video on her. Poet from the 17th century. Oh, sorry. Start at the beginning. I think you just pause. No? Anne Bradstreet was a famous poet from the 17th century. She's the first American poet and the first female poet to be published both in England and America. Bradstreet was born in England, 
where her father worked as an administrator for an earl. Her parents made sure that she was educated while growing up, more so than most women of the time. She met and married Simon Bradstreet, and then moved to America in 1630, along with Simon and her parents. The Bradstreets moved to what is today Massachusetts. Later, both her father and husband would be governors of Massachusetts, and they were instrumental in founding Harvard University. Like many of the other settlers in the area, Bradstreet belonged to a devout Protestant community called the Puritans. Among other things, the Puritans believed in predestination, or the idea that God controls the world and the people in it. Every situation, good or bad, was seen as being part of God's plan. Let's take a look at two of Bradstreet's poems and how her religious beliefs informed her writing. One of Bradstreet's most famous poems is called Verses Upon the Burning of Our House. As you might have guessed from the title, this particular poem was written after a fire destroyed the Bradstreet's house in 1666 leaving them with no home and no possessions. The poem is very long. It begins with a description of Bradstreet waking up to a fire. She escapes and then turns to look at the house as it burns. As she watches all of her belongings go up in smoke, she writes, And when I could no longer look, I blessed his grace that gave and took, that laid my goods now in the dust. Yea, it was so, and so t'was just. It was his own, it was not mine. Far be it that I should repine. He might have all justly bereft, but yet sufficient for us left. Notice that at a point when she loses all of her worldly possessions, she clings to her faith. She even says that she blesses God's grace and comforts herself with the idea that the belongings now burning belong to God, not to her. Of course, being human, Bradstreet does feel some grief. Later in the poem, she talks of going back to the scene of the fire later and being upset when she thinks about all she's lost. Yet she reminds herself, Then straight again my heart to chide, And did thy wealth on earth abide? Didst fix thy hope on moldering dust, The arm of flesh did make thy trust? Raise up thy thoughts above the sky, That dunghill mists away may fly. Thou hast a house on high erect, Framed by that mighty architect, with glory richly furnished, stands permanent, though this be fled. Here, she's telling herself that her earthly possessions are not nearly as important to Bradstreet as the riches that she'll encounter in heaven. In fact, she says, her earthly house is nothing compared to the house in heaven that is waiting for her, having been built by that mighty architect, God. As you can see, Bradstreet's faith played a key role in troubling times, like when she lost her house. This was common among Puritans, whose belief in predestination meant that they were able to face hard knocks with the faith that it was part of God's plan. Another part of the Puritan belief system that is part of this poem is a focus on the unimportance of earthly goods. Life in 17th century America was difficult at best, and the Puritans believed that luxuries and possessions were obstacles that kept one from heaven. However, there were some negative aspects of Puritan faith. Women were not treated as well as men. They were expected to serve the men in their lives and were sometimes kept from education. Despite her faith, Bradstreet acknowledged the problems with Puritanism. In a famous poem titled, In Honor of That High and Mighty Princess, Queen Elizabeth, Bradstreet attacks the Puritan belief in the inferior nature of women by singing the praises of Queen Elizabeth I of England. After lengthy descriptions of Elizabeth I's accomplishments, Bradstreet writes, Now say, have women worth, or have they none? Or have they some, but with our queen, is it gone? Nay, masculines, you have thus taxed us long, but she, though dead, will vindicate our wrong. Let such as say our sex is void of reason, no tis a slander now, but once was treason. Here, she says that men have taxed us long. That is, they have placed the burden of being inferior on women for a long time. The accomplishments of Queen Elizabeth prove that women are capable beings, and saying that women are void of reason is slander now, but once was treason. That is, saying that women are incapable is a hurtful lie now, but when Queen Elizabeth was alive, it was actually treason. Anne Bradstreet 
was America's first poet and the first female poet to be published in both the Old and New Worlds. Her Puritan faith informed much of her writing, though sometimes in very different ways. In verses upon the burning of our house, she depends on her faith to get her through the hardship of losing all of her worldly possessions. But she also criticizes the Puritan belief in the inferior nature of women in her poem, In Honor of That High and Mighty Princess, Queen Elizabeth. Okay. So what do y'all think about Anne Bradstreet? I've read some of her work in the past, and I've always loved her stuff. Like, I've always, I remember a couple years ago we did a few chapters on her in history, mm -hmm. and we read some of her poems, and I always enjoyed her poems compared to other authors at the time, because hers, I thought, did gear to start change in a positive way rather than in a way that was nearly like how today people would do it. Mm -hmm. So I like how she kind of influenced in like a healthier way, because when you look at like today's standards of what influencing is, it's nothing compared to a poem that actually can't start change. So do y'all believe that possessions, like the Puritans believed, do you believe possessions can keep us from heaven? They can. Depending on how much you worship it. Yeah, they can become idols. They can become idols, yes, I would agree with that. Like phones. <laughs> Every Social day. Yeah. <laughs> Anything, so. Um, what an interesting, you know, they, they lost everything, but yet they weren't that attached to it, so it probably wasn't as painful for them to lose everything, so. Very interesting work that she wrote. Um, so let's talk about what you're going to have to do this week. Um, by the end of the week, got to finish reading the summary of Benjamin Franklin's autobiography on Spark Notes, the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. What's up? They're reading all, okay. And then you're going to read Lesson 2, The Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. You're going to read Lesson 3, Upon the Burning of Our House, in Brad Street's poem, The Full Thing. And then you're going to read Lesson 4, No Book to Ban. So that will be a very interesting one. And then you're going to complete warm-up question on page 54. And this can be completed in your textbook or in your on notebook paper. And then you're actually completing for a grade the Concept Builder 3D. And your responses to the bulleted questions at the top of page 55 should be typed and printed for next week and brought to class. <laughs> and then read um, Lesson 5, A Good School. Um, questions about any of that? I like one of the questions of 3E. Draw a picture of a sunset. Can we turn that one in? <laughs> Can we turn that one in? <laughs> Can we turn that one in? Oh. What a poetry description. We, can't turn like, we should turn it into an electronic yeah. version because then we can just <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think that I've never a poem about a sunset. No, no. <laughs> we're not going to draw a picture of a sunset for the song. So. If this is art class, it'd be different, though. Yeah. So, I would love to see your artwork, but I you should try to in with your homework. How about that? Can I be extra credit with that? Uh, so, if it was kind of there have been some beautiful <laughs> sunsets lately. So, the sunrise this morning. Yes, it, it was, was like orange. Yeah, it was so pink and so beautiful. And I can't tell y'all how much I love driving across the lake to get here. And as I'm coming around the curves on Buford Dam to be able to see it out over the water. I like driving to school and having a Polaris eyes for the last hour. And today was, of course, the day I forgot my sunglasses. So I'm like riding the front seat. I'm like, this is so pretty. Right. Yes. <laughs> right. Very right. So it's just, you know, it, it's such a good reminder that um, God's still there, still on His throne when the sun rises and sunsets. Because there's, um, 
it's just such a good reminder that he's in control. And his mercies are new every morning. Um, questions about what we have to do this week? We got started a few minutes early, so we're actually going to finish a few minutes early. Um, any questions? No? Okay. Are you finding the, the course 